spoke all night. I went to sleep that night without knowing that it would be the last night I ever spent in that bed at my parents' house in London. Meredith, my mum shook me awake. The room was dark, making it obvious it wasn't morning yet, or not time to get up for school anyway. Mum, I mumbled in my half-asleep state. It's time to go. Everything I told you about those stories is true. It's time for you to leave us so you can train to be a protector. Your dad and I, we've done everything we possibly can to prepare you. First Charge is the first book in the Destiny Initiative series by Amanda Steele. The book can be purchased in paperback from Amazon. The e-book can also be purchased on Kindle, Kobo, Apple Books and many others. Spoken Day. Have you ever thought about what Santa Claus would be like as a zombie? Or maybe you've wondered how he would cope with climate change, Brexit or any number of issues facing the UK and beyond? Probably not, but if you're now wondering, you can buy The Twelve Deaths of Father Christmas by Amanda Steele. It's a collection of flash fiction stories with accompanying images in which Santa dies in different ways. There's a political slant to many of the pieces and added sarcasm. This is not for children. Ho, 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 ho. Merry Christmas! Ho, 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 ho. Spoken Label. Thank you today for tuning in to Spoken Label. Spoken Label was originally set up at the beginning of 2016 and as of recording has over 200 sessions in our archive. Although the podcast can be heard on Anchor, iTunes, Apple, Spotify, YouTube and literally 10 or 11 other networks. The full archive can be found at Spoken Label, and all one word, Spoken Label dot Bandcamp dot com. On the Bandcamp it is set as pay what you want, so you are entitled if you wish you can download it or stream it for nothing. But if you throw me a couple of pennies my way, it is always eternally grateful to help me maintain the operating costs and future running costs of this podcast. Enjoy. Hi guys, Andy N, Spoken Label, back in the house and back on Zoom again today. Reasonably local today, and I would over to one of my favourite areas, Alton. And I've got a gentleman on the phone here, or Zoom, that I know from previous guests, Gordon Zola and Jeff Arama, and it's Chris Chilton. Now, I met Chris a couple of times from through Bolton Socialist Club, which he runs... But I didn't know until very recently. He was a really decent poet as well. So I thought instantly after hearing him on the Sunday assembly, I wanted to get him in to have a chapter about his poetry. So, Chris, would you like to introduce yourself to everybody? Tell them who you are yeah. and what way all your poetry which you came from. It's beautiful stuff, you're right. Thanks, Andy. Uh, thanks for inviting me on. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Yes, yeah, so I'm Chris Chilton. I'm chair, chair of Bolton Socialist Club. You can probably tell by my accent that I'm not local to Bolton. Uh, we moved from uh, just north of London up to Manchester about 30 years ago. We've been in Bolton just a little bit less than that. Um, so I've always been, uh, been a writer. Uh, for many years, I, I've written uh, several plays, particularly when I was teaching. We, we, we did many productions at school um, and some in the community. Uh, I've written a novel, I've written short stories that, that are available uh, at various outlets. And uh, I've always dabbled in poetry. I did a, an MA in creative writing about 20 odd years ago. And, um, and I written with, with John Glover, who's a professor at uh, Bolton University. Oh, I know John. I know John, yeah. Yeah, John, yeah, yeah. John, John taught me when I, cause I did my degree at Bolton. Yeah. yeah him and um, Barry Wood, if you you remember that, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I kind of, um, I, I got on this course by accident when my wife went down to, to an open evening to, um, to uh, see if there's anything she, she wanted to get involved with. And uh, Barry Wood actually approached me, and you know, uh, and I said, Look, I'm not really, I'm too busy, you know, I was, I was running <laughs> part of the school. And, and uh, and I said, if I do anything, I'll do it with John. So the next thing, John came over and started chatting. <laughs> well, come down, don't worry, you know. So so I was, I joined his group for I don't know for about two months before I paid any money. You know, it's that kind of late. <laughs> um, but it was great. Anyway, I carried on with a bit, and it was great. You know, it was a real good experience with John. And I started writing poetry seriously then, really. 
In fact, one of the uh, selections in, in, in this book, uh, How to Count Trees, is actually um, a sequence that, I, that started then, actually, 20 years ago. Oh, fantastic. Uh, just a little after, 20, 2001, 2003, yeah. About a, it was a response to the invasion of Afghanistan. Um, so more recently, I've been very, I've been very much involved in uh, trying to raise awareness of climate change. We've done, I've organised several uh, events around Bolton and so on, because it's such a crucial issue. And uh, and we thought this year we were going to uh, we were going to have a uh, an event, an arts based event to create awareness or, or and, and do something more mainstream to try and get various uh, artistic people involved, you know, painters and writers and, and actors and so on. But of course, with uh, COVID, that uh, that was going to happen in June, but obviously COVID put, put a stop to that. I'd started writing this collection of poems about trees, which was going to be my contribution to it. And, um, and uh, I put it out... Uh, in a book instead, and uh, we've been trying to do readings. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame we can't get out in the open air and do it. You know, uh, oh, I'd love to do it. it, it would, yeah, well, well, the uh, Vicky Entwistle, who, who's the uh, kind of outreach officer for Woodland Trust, uh, kindly wrote a forward for me. And the, the plan was we were going to, you know, get around the, the Smiddles Woodland area, which is very near to where I live. Wow, to do you know, but unfortunately, we're not gonna have to do that. Maybe you know, next summer, maybe. So that's where this particular collection of poems come from. I've always most of the stuff I write has got some uh connection with either either politics or human rights or certainly the environment, but but what I suppose what you'd call issues, you know. Um, Although in, I have, there is in this book as well a tribute to Ian Jury, which is not political, but it is a kind of a human, a human element to that, you know. Uh, uh, and I think that's kind of what inspired me, really, Andy. You know, so brilliant, yeah, yeah, yeah. brilliant, yeah, great stuff. It's a lovely book. The piece I heard that's in the cinema were really, really, really effective, beautiful stuff. And I've heard you do some political ones, and you've been out with the writer Lord Bolton one in Zoom. So, did you find then? When you sat down to do this trees collection, then was it conscious? Was it conscious you were going to do this there, or was it were you planning to do more political ones? Um, no, it was consciously about. I, I, I don't know. The uh, I was inspired actually by a book called P, uh, by Peter Wellerbon, I think it was a German uh, forester and dendrologist, you know, an expert in trees. It's called The Secret Life of Trees, I think it's called, and it's brilliant. And it really does, uh, it, it brought trees alive. And, and simultaneously almost, I read a, a book by an American author, um, Richard Powers, called Overstory. And it was about a, a, a group of uh, environmental eco-warriors, really, you know, who, who were trying to save uh, ancient trees from being destroyed. And, and, and there was a lot of linkage between the two books. And that's really where, you know, the idea for writing these, these come from. So I, I did some research. I, I was careful not to do too much research. I didn't want to get too bogged down in science of, uh, and so on. But I wanted to know enough about trees that I could engage with them. And, and I wanted to give, kind of give voices to trees, as it were, rather than talk about trees and describe them, beautiful, beautiful as they are. Um, I think there's only so many poems that you can write in that way. So I tried to try to try to give the trees a character, and, and in some of the poems, the, the trees talk back to humans. You know. Oh um, yeah, oh, brilliant idea. <laughs> so so um, yeah, so that was really you know how many different ways can we look at a tree? What can trees tell us? Uh, I personally, I mean, my friend, uh, he he he's done a talk about trees uh, to U3A, you know, and uh, he, he had this great opening gambit that he said that, you know, if people came down to Earth from Mars and looking for the most successful life, life form, it probably would be trees. It wouldn't be humans. It would probably be trees. And he goes for a whole list of reasons why that should be. Oh, and, fantastic. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, and it... And they are, I mean, as well as being beautiful, they are fascinating uh, 
creations trees, you know, they, they're so long lasting. I mean, you know, you've got to think long term, haven't you, with trees, you know, they, they outlast us, uh, you know, by, by hundreds of years, uh, if they're allowed to grow. Um, and they've got so many different characteristics and the way they've adapted and they work together trees you know they've got this underground uh, i can't remember the word not my so i can't remember the rest of the, the but it, they're kind of, it's like uh, an underground network of, of filaments that link together and they expand that by kind of working together with fungal roots as well and some of these networks go over hundreds of acres and they warn each other of predators and uh, of, of approaching dangers so that other trees guard themselves and, and and they also offer sustenance to trees that are suffering they're amazing they're absolutely wow. amazing wow trees. nice so that's what you, inspired me wow do you think you've learned a lot about trees when doing this then have you all I've learned, I have learned a lot, but uh, yeah, and I've learned how to appreciate them. I still, I'm, I'm still learning to identify trees. You know, I'm still, I'm not brilliant at that. I, I, I know a lot more now than I used to. Uh, but there are so many different varieties of trees. It's almost, you know, it, it'd be a lifetime's work. You know, but oh I'm, yeah, I'm better at it. Yeah, I am. I, I am. I understand a lot more, and I understand a lot more about plants. And I understand certainly a lot more of their importance. You know, have you got any sort of personal favourite trees and have you and those? Really yeah, I like, I very much like the rowan and I love the silver birch trees. I, I, um, yeah, so I've, I've, I've heard of the rowan. I've seen beautiful. where I grew up, when my yeah. neighbours used to have a silver birch tree. It was a beautiful tree, it was. I remember yeah. that well. So, yeah, great choice. Yeah, so. The white trunks, and I've got a couple of poems, you know, I'll, I'm, I'll read those two as well later. You know. Yeah, cool, cool. It's very well, evocative. Yeah. yeah, yeah, completely. Do you have any sort of ideas where you'd like your poems to go next in? Would you want to do another book then, say? I, I think that, um, I'm sort of thinking around, I, I want the next collection to be around the environment because I think it's, it's, it's just an existential issue for us all, isn't it? You know? Yeah, yeah, no, completely. Um, so I want it to be something around there. Um, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do it. That, that, that almost certainly will be the next collection of poems to do. will be environmental. Um, no, of course. Great uh, stuff. Great stuff, man, indeed. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, then, last, that's pretty all my questions today. So, I'm the one to let you concentrate more on your poetry today. But um, if people want to get hold of your book, Chris, where are the best going? Well, it's available on Amazon or it's available from me. Um, but if you can contact me, um, either on Facebook or uh, Twitter, or I'm at Chris underscore Chilton at hotmail.com. Um, I can post all those details to you. Yeah, yeah. So send them over to Chris. Always good that. I'm just going yeah, to yeah. But I'm that. Yeah, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, they can also just go onto the Bolton um, Socialist Club website. And just there's a, there's a, a pro form when they fill in, and that will come to me. So, uh, that's probably the best way. If you if you get it to me, I'll, I'll post them out, and it will be with you in a few days. If we do a try, pay, you know, PayPal or whatever. You know. Yeah, I just I can see your book here actually. That's it's yeah. how to count trees and other poems. That's the one, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, got it. I'm gonna order that definitely. Yeah. For that sort of price, yeah, definitely. So I know. Right, what we'll then do, Chris? We'll we'll take a quick break. Let you. Get yourself composed. <laughs> I want to get a good point ready for myself. Brilliant stuff. I've really enjoyed it today. Thank you, Michael. Okay. okay. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. I'll see, you. see you in a minute, guys. Stay safe. Spoken on Hi, guys. Okie dokie. Straight over Chris. He's going to start off with his title poem for this book here, which I'm looking forward to this. Over to you, mate. Okay. So, yeah, I'm going to read How to Count Trees, which is uh, the, the uh, title poem of this anthology. If you want to count all the trees in one tenth of an acre, you would use a radius of 37.2 feet and count all the trees within the circle it creates, and then you can multiply by 10 to get the number of trees per acre. That formula is from Laurie Bronze on Quora. The number of trees on Earth before the advent of human civilization, 6 trillion. The number of trees on Earth now, three trillion. 
The population of Earth in 3000 BCE, when Stonehenge was built, 14 million. The population on Earth now, 7.7 billion. The ratio of trees to humans in 3000 BCE, 430,000 to one. The ratio of trees to humans in 2020, 390 to one. The diversity of living things that thrive in and among trees, currently unknown. The number of trees lost in the last 100 years alone, 750 million. As a percentage of all the trees lost since Stonehenge was built, 25. The number of new trees planted each year, 4.5 million. The number of trees cut down every year, 15 million. The difference between the number of trees planted and those felled, 10.5 million. The number of tons of carbon dioxide per year absorbed by 10.5 million trees, 23 million. The number of raindrops that fall on the leaves of a beech tree in a summer storm, incalculable. The kilograms of CO2 a mature tree absorbs from the atmosphere every year, 22. The carbon footprint in kilograms per year of the average person in the USA, 20,000. Of the average person in the UK, 9,000. Of the average person in China, 4,500. Of the average person in Somalia, 200. The number of people forced out of the Sahel region of Africa as it becomes desert, 100 million. The woodland shades of green, red, brown and yellow through the seasons, innumerable. The parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere in the year 1700, 275. The parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere on February 9th, 2020, 413.7. The rise in global temperature compared to pre-industrial times, 1.1 degrees Celsius. The rise in global temperature expected by the 2030s, just 10 years from now, 1.5 degrees Celsius. The number of meters at sea level will rise when the Greenland ice dome melts, six. The number of meters at sea levels will rise when Antarctica's ice sheets melt, 15. The number of times sunlight as the sun rises dances on the leaves of a sycamore unknowable. The displaced population of the Maldives as it's swallowed by the Indian Ocean, 500,000. The displaced people of ancient Alexander as the Mediterranean rises a mere half metre, 8 million. The population of Bangladesh trapped between melting glaciers and rising seas, 163 million. The pools of dappled light on the forest floor in springtime, unquantifiable. The beauty of a wooded glade in the summer luminescence of chestnut leaves, inestimable. The value of what trees know and the secrets of the forest beyond reckoning. Fantastic, that one. Really, really evocative, Chris. What I ask you about this, that obviously the level of detail on that, did you have to do an awful amount of research on that? It sounds like you. Quite a bit of research, quite a bit. Um, yeah, wow. It's all out there. That information is all out there. It's in the public domain. You know, it's uh, not that difficult to acquire. You know? um, but yeah, I mean, uh, some of that came from the, the book I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's, it's staggering. Really, yeah. Uh, I thought I'd read next, if that's all right, Andy. Uh, Silver birch. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, After I said before about silver birch trees, yeah, <laughs> kind of makes sense. Yeah, right. this is this is 
probably the only poem I've, I've written that's uh, a kind of response to, to the COVID uh, pandemic. So this is Silver Birch. Our friend had gone unexpectedly. There was no chance to say goodbye or see her one last time. Such was the speed of her departure and the limitations on mourning. To compensate, we flicked through photos taken as we'd walked through woodland once on the day the bluebells burst into shaded bloom among the muscular beaches and random oaks. Now each inflorescence became a tribute and lament, each small violet bell a silent sacramental knell. Further on, we'd come across a clearing where a giant beech had fallen during some earlier storm and where now a stand of silver birch trees grew, a shock of white among the ancient bark and towering crowns. In their young life and early leaf, they looked at first like winter's bones or fleshless skeletons from some other plague. But closer to, their paleness glowed. The slender trunks already etched with life's tears and the ache of newness strained for light among the arching boughs of gathered giants. Fragile, yes, and with no guarantees, but it was life doing what life does. Excellent ending there. Oh, we have really, really great stuff, Chris. I'm going to read now. Um, I'll, I'll read a light poem, actually. Um, oh, cool. This is... Uh, Just to show that trees can be fun. I'll read Willow. Willow. A sighing shawl of sorrow, a packamack of cheer, a grieving veil of mournful tears, a laughing cloak of joy, a chaste chador of prudence, a flirty negligee a swirling cape of verdant life, a shroud of fa fading light, slender leaves and silky hair and dioecious flowers. I meet you at the water's edge and while away the hours. A fall of leaves and yellow seeds, abundant and resplendent. The way I see your beauty tree is clearly mood dependent an overcoat of self-restraint, a therapy of spirit, a long police of quietude, a flippant petticoat, a green amice that harbours peace, a gown of joie de vivre, a pelerine of empathy, the lovely willow tree. Oh yeah, that's that's a very different chin tone, that, Chris. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. You've got quite, yeah, you've got a real varied book here, so definitely so. Right, uh, how many more? Do, how many more do you like to read today? I don't. I'm, I'm flexible for a bit, a bit longer, mate. If you want to, I'll read. I'll read you Rowan, which is a favourite poem of mine. Rowan. A Rowan came into view as we climbed towards the ridge, stretching outwards from a crag of grey fissured rock, and angled forward as though about to dive gracefully into the valley from which we had ascended like some stubborn old Olympian, unable to wave goodbye to past glories. Its grey trunk was one with the rock, and as we neared, we saw the wounded evidence of its age. A branch jagged and splintered, another sheared clean off, the riven cankered bark. Though bright creamy clusters of hermaphroditic blooms still adorned its reaching limbs, my hiking companion, Rob, a brooding presence since the loss of his wife, stopped for breath and stared ahead in the manner to which I'd grown used and allowed him due space and time to navigate his resurgent grief or dismay or failure to make sense of Bruce's absence these last six months since chemo 
and her indomitable will had failed to keep her alive. In a few more weeks, the rowan would be awash with crimson berries, each carrying the seed of new life, and maybe it was worth another trip just to see their vibrant splendour. It's a beauty, he said, moist eyed from the wind, a thing of rugged beauty. See how it's holding on, tenacious for life. We could, I thought, call it Ruth's tree. I'd tell him later in the pub over a pint, an arm round the shoulders of a man carrying a rucksack on a narrow path, being something of an awkward business. Fantastic. Oh, brilliant. Again, mate, really, really cool stuff, this, mate. Um, right, so we'll see. The big, yeah, the big conclusion now, isn't it? <laughs> uh, should we do another lighter one? Yeah, yeah. Do, do, yeah. Do, do, another, do another slightly lighter one, yeah, to conclude it, mate. Yeah, I think so. This is, this is Blackthorn. Blackthorn. They were 16 when, one April day, they came across a blackthorn so alive and white with blossoms, it blazed among the hedgerow and drew them over the rutted field to its warm and private embrace. It wasn't that they'd searched for such a place, though he'd brought a blanket in his rucksack just in case, along with sandwiches, apples and cans of warm cola. Up close, the architecture with its thorny limbs seemed less appealing now and counseled caution as though subdued by a change of heart or lack of nerve. But then they kissed and he felt her ripening curves and she felt her lungs would burst and he almost forgot the blanket and she was glad she'd brought protection and he the egg and mayo sandwiches because all this love made you so, so hungry. Some 15 years on, they crossed the same field, one late September day as the leaves turn yellow. The fruit is ripe and lush and ready for picking. They wear gloves this time and long sleeves for protection from the thorns and take a selfie kissing the black thorn as their backdrop. Then gather plump berries, smiling in their safe things, warm in their memories, snug in their smugness. Back home, they prick the berries with a pin, mixed with sugar, and wait patiently for three months to make slow gin. Purple, sweet and plummy to the taste, and afterwards, slow love. Okay. That last line's killer, that one. Ooh, excellent. Excellent stuff, Chris. Brilliant. I really enjoyed it today. Thank you for this today, mate. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Andy. It's great. Good nice to have the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, because I, mean, I know when I heard you, what, was that a month and a half ago over at Sunday Assembly? I've been looking forward to chatting to you ever since in this one. It's been, yeah, it's been what I've hoped for. Awesome. Done. Fantastic. Yeah. So, right, well, hang around, Chris. I need to speak to you off mic. Well, thank you again, mate. And hopefully we'll be able to have a hopefully bit of a in person at some point fairly soon when we eventually get out of lockdown. So, but yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is Andy and Andy out. That. signing out, guys and girls. So stay safe, and as Don Callis says, stay old. Spock on me.